Welcome to the Soulish Podcast. My name is Whitney Apke and I am your host. I'm so excited that you are here to listen to my new podcast series, Soulish. Here, I'll be talking all about the ish of our souls. The ish being negative thought patterns, blockages, challenges, but also the victories, aha moments, and breakthroughs we experience in our mind, emotions, and will. We'll dive deep and talk about everything in between, of course. I'm excited to share my experiences and thoughts as well as bring on guests who can help us make the connections between our spirit, soul, and body. It's my desire to uplift, encourage, and inspire you in each podcast. Thank you so much for listening to yet again another episode. I can't believe that this is episode 10 already of the Soulish podcast. It's kind of crazy that I've been doing this already for 10 weeks. It feels like I've been doing it for years and it also feels like I just started. (laughs) Um, But so last week in episode nine, uh, I had a wonderful guest, Kevin Crenshaw, the heart guy, and he was just phenomenal, amazing, uh, so much insight. And even when we talked off the recording, he's just so lovely, such a lovely person, so deep and um, has gone through a lot. And that's why he has that depth. And we talked a lot about the healing process and how to heal and how to let go. And so I actually put a poll out on the Soulish uh, IG and even my personal IG and just asking people, you know, would you want to hear more about this healing process? Would you want to hear more about my journey Um, even though I'm early on in this podcast, I think that's the whole point, right? Is authenticity and openness and vulnerability and honesty and, and sharing from my heart and experiences equals sharing the little bottom depths and the, the things that I've walked through that were so painful and the suffering years, you know, in my life of suffering. And, uh, I just think it's so powerful when we share how we got through the worst times in our life or the hardest times in our life, the most painful times in our life. I think it's so powerful because we have authority to speak about what we have overcome. Like I told Kevin last week, you know, you have authority in what you have overcome. You have authority and not authority just even in your own life, but authority to speak and share to others. And when you speak and you share your truth and your journey and how you overcame all your pain and suffering and circumstance, that actually helps others to find freedom. And that actually helps people walk out their own healing. And there's just, there's an energy behind it. There's an authority behind your story and your words. And, you know, the the balance there is that we don't want our narrative to be victim, you know, mentality of what has happened to us. And we don't want to necessarily share from a victim standpoint, what's really powerful and helps other people as well as helps yourself continue in overcoming is when you come from the, uh, perspective of I am powerful and I am empowered and, I overcame, you know, I, not this was done to me and woe is me, but more of the, hey, this happened and this was so painful and so difficult and it was a long process uh, or a difficult process, but I overcame, I didn't give up, right? That's more powerful than any other perspective you could come from. So today I would like to share with that in mind, and I would like to share my journey with you, not from a victim perspective, but from a man, this was painful. And it was, yes, it was betrayal. It was unfair. It was hurtful. It was painful. It devastated me, but I overcame it. And I want to share with you how I overcame it. So I would like to actually start from the beginning, if you would be so kind as to listen uh, from the beginning of my uh, little journey as a little Whitney, four years old. Um, I grew up in a Christian and a pastor's home, and so that's where you kind of probably have heard a little bit of my perspective as 
far as um, spirituality and how I relate to God, the universe source, the great spirit. And so my parents were always helping people. And I think that's where my roots have come from as far as that deep desire and longing uh, to not just live a life for myself, but to live my life for others. And that's really where that comes from. At four years old, my dad was involved in a really bad car accident. It was actually not a fast one. Uh, They were only going, I think, 30 miles per hour. But it was very um, devastating because of the way that my dad was positioned in the car. Uh, He was a passenger and was in the front passenger seat and was twisting um, to look at actually a really cool classic car along with his buddy who was driving. And unfortunately, in front of them were a couple teenagers, maybe 15, 13, somewhere in there, were kind of doing a joyride thing, right? And uh, they slammed on the brakes all of a sudden, and my dad's uh, car plowed into them, uh, only at like 30 miles per hour. But it was enough that my dad, because he was twisted, um, looking at a really cool classic car, and of course, they were distracted, so they didn't see it. And that basically caused him to uh, rupture a disc in his lower back. And from that point on, uh, our life really changed. Uh, It was, you know, the the family dynamic really changed. And for years, my dad suffered from back pain. He did get uh, surgery about a year later. We grew up middle class, um, you know, and especially if you're in ministry, you're typically not rich. <laughs> so um, you're typically doing it because you love people and you love what you do, not for the money. So we we grew up more low than middle. But my dad, you know, couldn't get out of bed normally. He would have to roll over on his side and crawl to the bathroom to then uh, use the countertop to stand. And so he he really suffered. And um, there were a couple years in my early childhood that he was uh, not suffering as much and was definitely more available. I saw him more. He was involved more in my life and in my family. Um, but then, you know, a couple years, like in early preteen years, um, he's that, that replacement disc, it was a temporary solution, but that's all that, you know, we could afford at that moment. But that actually had disintegrated, so it was now bone on bone with nerve in between. So his nerves were actually being pinched and frayed and grinded down. He was in a lot of pain, (laughs) a lot of pain, and was basically bedridden because of that. What this did for me, because it's not, I don't want to tell you necessarily his story, uh, which is very powerful, and I would love to have him on this podcast to share, um, you know, for those of you who have really deeply suffered in your body. Um, or in your mind, or in your emotions, uh, my dad has a wealth of knowledge and wisdom on how to walk that out. And so I would love to have him on the podcast sometime. But in in this kind of environment, in a home where someone is suffering, it really, um, it, it just, it's not anyone's fault, but it just creates, you know, that feeling of, of being unsafe or lack of security or fear of the future, because you don't know when it's going to be a good day and when it's going to be a bad day. And uh, my dad's the sweetest man. He never lashed out or anything like that at all. But it there was this sense of pressure, you know, and of stress and um, that negativity that's in the air and in the environment simply just because of the level of suffering, right, going on. It's it's again, it's no one's fault. It's it's not created intentionally. It's just what happens when when you have someone in your home that is deeply suffering physically and mentally and emotionally because of the physical pain. So for me, living with someone who was suffering created an unstable and low vibrational environment. But also I learned a depth of love and long suffering that no one else can understand unless you've experienced it as well. And this also grew in me such a huge desire to help people to heal and to end suffering because in a sense, as a kid, I I felt so helpless. There was nothing I could do. Uh, There was absolutely nothing any of us could do to help him and to help him end, you know, the suffering. There's nothing you can do. There's no, you know, pain medicine. That's not enough. Um, you know, there's nothing. Um, and we tried everything growing up and so did my mom. My mom was amazing and a pillar 
for us all. And um, she's an incredible woman, and I hope to be her one day. Um, that's kind of a goal, <laughs> a life goal to be as strong and uh, formidable and wise and compassionate and patient as my mom. Um, she's incredible. I can't say enough. <laughs> Fasting forward to after graduating college, grew up in high school, really wanting to always, you know, pursue that. And I thought it was in the confines and construct of church and ministry, because that's all I knew. Like, this is how you help people is in church. Um, but so I went to college and I studied religion, spirituality, generational trends and issues and psychology. And I really felt like I was supposed to come home. So I came home and I felt like there was a purpose for me returning home. But really when I came home, I went immediately on a really um, interesting journey and totally opposite of what I thought my life was going to be like. And I um, I fell in love and I experienced heartbreak, which led to me basically abandoning the need to be loved um, because I was so deeply wounded and, and for all from the betrayal, um, the depth of betrayal and pain. Um, and I just started pouring myself into helping people because that's what I knew best. And that was how I had any kind of feeling of happiness and joy. Other than that, I felt hollow and like I had a pull, um, you know, through my heart and through my chest. And, um, I felt like I couldn't breathe. There were many nights where I literally started to just scream in pain because I would cry so hard. And I didn't know this at the time, but it, it really was my heart chakra and even as I tell this story, I'm actually kind of experiencing a little bit of pain. It's bringing up that memory in my um, energy body. So it's it it's a deep, deep, deep wound. What happened? And um, I, I'll I'll explain a little bit of it. Basically, um, I dated this guy. We had been friends for a year and a half prior to dating. And um, while we were dating, there were a couple signs I totally turned a blind eye to uh, because I just believed the best about him, which is what we do when we love people, right? Is we believe the best and we assume the best. And I was, I was young, I was 23. So I hadn't really experienced anything and I didn't date. I didn't date in high school. I went on a couple dates in college, but they were very like, you know, burger fry date, you know, and just hanging out and having fun and talking and stuff. But there was never any kind of relationship or love there. It was just kind of like fun, you know, and fun to experience. And I had amazing guy friends, um, Oh my gosh. And I like owe a lot to them because they really helped me grow and to even learn how to talk to men and how to relate to men um, as a woman. Cause I just didn't really, I didn't have that with my dad. I kind of sort of didn't have that with my brother. Um, so growing up, that was kind of, that was my one experience and man, they called me out on so much bullshit and it was so great and I so needed it. So thank you to you guys. If you're listening, you know who you are. I love you very much and always will. Things just didn't feel right. There were things that just didn't make sense. And I just realized, okay, I don't think he's in the right place. I had no idea. I had no idea what was actually going on, which was the fact that he is like a sexaholic, um, you know, like porn like crazy, uh, sleeping with anything with two legs and a vagina and had no monogamous bone in his body, completely opposite of the man that I thought I knew. And the thing was, he had two different names and he lived two different lives and probably still does. And, um, and so that was the deception, right? That he could be two, two different people and live two different lives. And what happened with me, because I'm that person, I go deep and I get real. And so those two different lives and even those two different names, which the name that he was, his alter ego or alternate personality, uh, I wasn't actually allowed to ever use that name. Uh, it was actually told to me on our first date, you're not allowed to call me by that name. So I missed major signs. <laughs> I missed major, major, major signs, guys. So <laughs> please like totally, totally be like, wit, you were stupid. Yes, I was. I had no idea. I was like, hmm, 
that's weird. That's interesting. I've never (laughs) heard of that before. I've never been told that before. Bottom line, you know, and he was on his journey and is still probably on his own journey like we all are. So I'm coming from this place like back then, totally judged him, hated him, hated all men because of him and did not date for like five, six years, really probably even longer than that. Um, This was like, it took me like a good solid like five years to even get over everything that happened. But um, I, I am so different now where now I have such a different perspective, especially with working with people that there's no judgment. Um, now, now I see, oh gosh, yeah, he was just on a journey and that's his journey. Uh, he picked this life, right? He chose this life when he came back, uh, to earth. If you believe in reincarnation and he chose this so that he could hopefully overcome some of those issues or, or choices. So whatever his lessons are, that's his journey. And those are his choices, his life choices. And, Um, what that did for me was that took me on a journey of self-love and I, I realized how much I didn't, um, have self-confidence. I, I did not affirm myself daily in the truth and the values and the worth that I know I have. So I was absolutely destroyed and wrecked as a person. And this is the key to this is if you ever get devastated, especially in love, love can devastate you, especially when you've been betrayed, cheated on. And I've talked with so many men that have experienced the same thing and women who have experienced the same thing in just a different costume. And a lot of them cannot get over the fact that they were cheated on. It takes a direct hit, right, on your self-worth and your value in such a way that it's so hard to get over it because it it touched your identity and your core belief about yourself and what you're worth and how you're received and how you're loved and how you're appreciated. And so that's that's everything. And if we don't first have that within ourselves, Yes, you're going to get absolutely wrecked. But if you're solid in who you are and you're confident, I think when we come from that place of we're in a high vibrational state, we know who we are, we know our worth, then you can better walk that out. For me, I had to build that from the ground up. I got leveled and, uh, and I was intentional about turning over every brick and deciding whether or not that was something I wanted to build myself back up with. And so I really evaluated a lot of my core beliefs, a lot of my mindsets. I started to recognize, you know, emotional loops, especially after being hurt like that. And um, I really suffered with memories. That was a hard one to get over was the memories of being together uh, because I just was so Twitter pated and just totally in love with him, had no clue. I had no inkling that, um, that was the type of person he was. And that was, you know, that he was even living a double life. I, I would have never, I would have never seen it and I didn't see it. So I think first, when you go through something that is so painful and wrecks you, the first thing to do is to lean into that pain and to lean into all of the things that you are hearing yourself say to yourself. And to be very, very aware and present. It's not so present with the, oh, woe is me. It's present with the, see, I knew it. I knew it would never work out. I knew as soon as I would be truly seen that I wouldn't be accepted. I knew that this would never work out. I'm just not meant to find love. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of that life of pleasure, of acceptance, of being understood, of being loved. Those thoughts are the thoughts that you want to pay attention to. And those thoughts are the thoughts that you want to turn and say, okay, let's affirm the opposite of this. I am worthy. I am meant to love because I have the desire for it. If I wasn't meant to love, I wouldn't have the desire. And I just didn't meet the right person. Or I didn't meet them at the right time. And they're on their own journey and so am I. And so you start to turn those things on their head and repeat the opposite of what you're hearing. But it's so important that you're present with that and that you're not just wallowing, um, which maybe there's a time to wallow. You know, there's a time to really hurt over it and to feel it. If you stuff it down, that's dangerous. But 
it's so important to be present. I've come to realize, and I think this is something that I wish I would have maybe understood earlier in my journey of healing and the healing process, is that every person, whether an executive or a parent or farmer or teacher or billionaire or little boy, we are all on a journey of self-discovery. And so, you know, I basically expect that that ex-boyfriend will reap what he sowed and he will experience what he gave and what he put out. It will come back to him. Same as I expect to reap what I sow and or experience uh, what I give or put out to people, I, I know that will come back to me. We have to know that within ourselves. So that's even more of an empowering moment of realization that everything comes back to us. So you know that they're going to get theirs. You don't have to be critical and judge them and hope that for them. You can actually wish them well in their journey and just hope that they'll learn. But whether it's you know, makes it all worth it that they learn from the lesson. You can't go there, which I did. And then I got really mad when I didn't see anything change. I think that mindset can actually hang you up even more because now the worth of that experience now is dependent on them and their journey and you can't do that. But you can know that everything comes back to us and that's true for everybody else as it is for you. So when you put out good vibes, only good vibes come back to you, right? If you send out love and light to that person, you hope that they see truth, you hope that they come to realize their you know, shortcomings or, or their lifestyle is not conducive to what they actually want, which is you know, a long-term relationship, a marriage, a spouse, a partner. And if they, if they want that, then they're going to have to be faithful to one person. They're going to have to be already living that lifestyle before they meet you and date you. And I think that's also a key. Ladies out there, do not date somebody who is like, you know, just hitting the whole town up. Um, Date somebody who is super intentional and is choosy because you know that when they're super intentional and choosy and they're choosing you, they're authentic and they're worthy of your time and they're worthy of your affection. So we have to know within ourselves, you know, what are the unmet needs that we have Uh, for me, it was in a sense, a lack of a man in my life. And even though my dad, whenever he could be available, he was, he didn't abandon me by choice. And I wouldn't even say he abandoned me. I would just say he wasn't present because he couldn't be right. So there's no judgment on him at all. I have no resentment. In fact, I have just sadness because I know how much he wanted to be present, but couldn't. And that is something that weighs heavily on him. And I'm completely aware of that. And so I always speak that to him. I always affirm that in him, that dad, you're an amazing dad. Just the fact that you even didn't quit and you didn't give up, you stuck with it. You stayed on earth for me and Aaron, my brother and my mom. And you didn't give up. And that that is the biggest lesson that I've ever learned from my dad. That's true masculinity is perseverance and not giving up. And um, that's such a lesson that I've learned of long suffering, even within yourself. And I've done a lot of inner work and inner healing to gain freedom from operating or even talking with men out of that place of need. Instead, I want to talk out of a place of desire, right? Not out of need, but out of want, out of because it's just a desire that I have to meet that guy one day, right? And so I I don't want to operate out of need because then I'm only taking, I'm not giving, and so if that's, that's one thing for us, as we're in the healing process, a lot of times we can get needy and it's not because we're a needy person. It's because we have an unmet need. And now we have a pain, which has created a new reality of lack and lack mentality. And that is what is very dangerous when you're in your healing process. If you don't recognize it and if you don't acknowledge it, if you ignore it and you just do what feels good you will have a longer journey of healing. And mine has been a 10-year journey of healing. It was not short (laughs) because I went through all of those processes and I know them so well. 
So again, there's no judgment as you're in your process, you're in your process. But I think what's helped me is understanding too that I'm in my process and so are everybody else. We're all in a process of awakening and self-discovery and learning about ourselves and, and recognizing those parts of our early childhood and development that have uh, translated into either um, needs or uh, default beliefs that we we don't know that are more on the in the background running right that are subconscious that are not like consciously we're we're choosing this it's just this like there's this thing in the back that is causing us to make the decisions that we're making and that don't benefit our life and so it's good when you're in that healing process and when something has caused you pain it's such a great opportunity to bring all those things that aren't usually on the surface that are now on the surface. And it's so amazing to acknowledge and to work on those things that you need to develop and you need to reaffirm yourself and you need to heal and you need to realign with your values, your truth, and your purpose. That is the time. And the healing process isn't just healing from the pain. It's also realigning with yourself. When you are living in your purpose and you are living in your power, That power actually is coming from source. That's a divine energy. And divine energy flows everywhere, right? It flows in the trees. That's how trees grow. That's how life happens. And so divine energy is where we need to come from. And so that that means you need to meditate. You need to hook up with the source. You need to be coming from that place. And because I was working in my own energy and helping people out of my own energy, I got super depleted. And I started resenting myself, my gifts, my desires to help people, even my dreams for my life. I decided to take a step back and remove myself from any output except for actual work, which would provide for me. I really needed to nourish myself, my soul. I needed a a new perspective. And to get perspective, I had to move away from everything and allow time and distance to help me heal. And that was maybe the best decision I made And at that same point, I actually met somebody and dated them for the next four years. And we just weren't in alignment um, towards the end. And so had to walk away, which is part of life, right? And super painful again, but a different kind of pain, Um, definitely because there was no betrayal. Uh, So this was kind of a new pain to walk through. Um, and letting go. And Kevin called me on it last week, which was hilarious. Um, I hope you guys all laughed with me when he called me out. And I just, I love that. That's why I laughed. I I didn't laugh because I was nervous or anything. I was like, oh my gosh, like that's so true. And it just hit me and it made me laugh because it was like, oh my God, that's exactly what I've been doing. You're right. You know, and I just love that. I I so appreciate moments like that. And I, I appreciated Kevin being so um, candid (laughs) and so honest and raw. He, he's an expert. He's been doing it for years. So he, he knows it from his own walk and he knows it from all the people, thousands of people that he has, uh, coached and helped and counseled. So I think this is the thing. And I love this quote too, because it's so true. And this is another, this is an, this is an aspect of healing that is so true and is what you end up walking away with. And so I love this quote by Eliza Tabor. It's disappointment to a noble soul is what cold water is to burning metal. It strengthens, tempers, intensifies, but never destroys it. And it's so true when you walk through your healing process and you really dive deep into yourself, your healing, and and reaffirm yourself, man, in that moment of pain, there's nothing more powerful. There's nothing more strengthening and intensifying that truth and that value than in that moment. You can, you know, on a good day, meditate and reaffirm yourself and all of that, but it's really not going to, it's not going to really matter as much as when you are feeling threatened and that truth and that value seems not true and not your reality and to call that into your reality in that moment and to realign is even more fortifying. And so you will experience a new level of strength 
and confidence within yourself when you walk through that healing process. So it is absolutely worth it. For a while, I became bitter and I became resentful and angry. But I see now in looking back when I was experiencing all of that, I was purging from all the things I held in and ignored over the years. And so if you're experiencing any of that, that bitterness, that resentment towards yourself, you're angry that you didn't see it, that you were an idiot. You weren't. You were actually so authentic. Your intentions were pure. And if you hold on to that, that I, at the core of who I am, am intentional, I'm authentic, I'm real, and I'm deep, and I want to deeply connect, and I just didn't see it because I believed the best, which is maybe one of the best qualities about yourself, that you believed the best of somebody, that is love. You are embodying love. The only aspect of that that you didn't have at that moment was wisdom and intuition. So now walking forward and moving on, and experiencing new relationships and new experiences in your career, in your relationships, in your family, in your life, now, now you have wisdom. Now you know how to listen to your intuition along with still being that person who believes the best about other people and yourself. So it's, it's just about coupling that and marrying that together. I love this Buddha quote. It's awesome. And I love Buddha quotes so much. So I'm sorry if you're going to, you're going to hear a lot of Buddha quotes on this podcast because I love them, but I love this one. So holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I actually heard this growing up a lot and I never knew who it came from, but when you're Holding on to unforgiveness, it's the justice, it's the vengeance, it's the I need to make this right and it wasn't right, it's not right, it hasn't been righted, (laughs) it hasn't been, justice has not happened yet. And I know we feel this a lot in our culture right now and that's okay, but once we start to walk in forgiveness, we'll actually see the justice and experience it finally and that's true for within yourself, that's true within our culture and society, that's true in life period. Because as you're holding something against somebody, it's like holding an object against a wall. That wall isn't exerting any energy, isn't feeling you holding that against it. You are holding that against it. You're expelling all this energy, putting all this effort into holding this thing, depending on how heavy you're given even more energy, right? Into holding that thing against the wall. And that energy is coming from you solely, not from the wall, not from the person. The person is not affected by it, but you are. So you are going to remain toxic, negative. It's like a poison inside of you. And so what needs to happen is you need to drop it. You need to not drink the poison. You need to forgive and let go and walk away. Because like I said earlier, everything that we give, everything that we put out comes back to us. They will get theirs and you need to get yours. And part of you getting yours, because if you think about it, here you are, what are you putting out? Anger, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness. That's going to come back to you. You don't want to put that out. You actually want to let that go. You don't want to stir that pot any longer. You want to let go and forgive. It's not for that person. It's for yourself, right? So as I cycled through sadness and regret because of all of that, everything I experienced, I was seeing myself and what was left of me and recognized all the times I didn't show up for myself. And that was part of that sadness and that regret is I I saw how little I showed up for myself, but gosh, did I show up for others? And I realized this needed to switch. I can't show up for people and have an impact in their lives and truly help them if I don't show up for myself, if I don't love myself and give myself exactly what I'm giving others, how can I expect for them to feel my love if I don't love myself, right? It can't come from only that. And if I'm operating in such a way that I'm only giving to others and I'm not giving to myself, then I don't value myself and neither are other people. And that's what I experienced 
It's exactly what I experienced. People gobbled up everything I put out. Nobody gave back to me. Do I have any friendships from any of those moments of giving and pouring myself and life into other people? Absolutely not. In fact, many of them got bitter, resentful, angry with me. A lot of them got offended and were like, you know, whatever, left the friendship. I gave my life, I gave years to like nine women. And are any of them contacting me? No. But it's, it's, and there's no resentment, there's no unforgiveness. It's, this is the point. If you don't love yourself and if you don't value yourself, neither will other people. And they will gobble up everything you have to give and they will not value you. They'll see you as a free resource and that's it. So you have to show up for yourself. And in this time of healing, this is when you really show up for yourself. You become your own savior in that aspect. You don't need anyone to save you. In fact, no one can until you do. And so for ladies, I'm speaking to you right now because that's part of our femininity. We want to be protected. We want to be safe. We want to feel safe with our partner and our spouse. And we want that. We want that savior. That's why we watch all of the princess movies and Disney movies and love stories and romance novels and all of that. Any kind of story where there's any kind of aspect of us being discovered and rescued or um, loved and taken in and um, pursued, any of that, we absolutely eat up. Why? Because it comes from a an innate desire within ourselves to be, to be captivating. So for men, part of that is you need to show up for yourself because how are you going to show up for your partner? If you don't show up for yourself, how can you protect them when you don't even protect yourself? How can you steward them when you don't even steward yourself? And men are protectors. Men are, are stewards by nature. They have dominion. And they steward and protect all that they possess. And, and they have such foresight. And it's just incredible to be around because it's like, dang, I did not see that happening. But they did. <laughs> and they made sure it wasn't going to happen. You know, they, they think through processes so differently and so unique compared to women. So men, you need to show up for yourself in order to be that powerful man who can see the right person for you and value her. You have to value yourself. You can't give what you don't have. And you want to give yourself to somebody. It's a desire that you also have. And so if you want to give yourself to a woman and if you want her to give herself to you in that way that is so powerful when you love somebody, then show up for yourself and don't, don't put out. Just because you have the need to put out, don't put out. Save it because then you can put out all you want with the right person, which is going to be even more satisfying than a hookup. I began to dream again and began feeling hopeful for my future finally after around five, six years of walking through healing. I invested everything I had in my current relationship and family and began to understand in a really real way that everyone is on a journey. And for me to expect people to either be where I am or ahead of me because of how I relate to them or who they are in my life, it isn't fair. Because everyone's on their own journey. And it's discrediting to them and their process and their journey. And how would I feel if someone told me I should be way further down the road than I am? So why would I do that to somebody else? And that's kind of why I walked away from my last relationship as well. We can't be bitter. We just have to move on and move forward. And if, if they meet us again in, in life, then great. If not, then maybe in another lifetime. But again, it's more of that understanding and the place that you're coming from, which is love. If you, if you truly love somebody, you love them in their process and their journey and you know when it's time to let go. Eckhart Tolle said to forgive them is only something that you do for yourself because you free yourself from the burden of having to live with a narrative or a story of betrayal. And that's been the biggest part of my journey and my walk is for so many years, it was my narrative. My narrative was a victim narrative. It was a betrayal narrative. It was, 
you know, how could he have done narrative? And, and instead, I want the narrative of I overcame and the narrative of I healed and I learned. And that's what I try to do for other people. I try to get them to see that um, and walk them through that, that process and that, you know, that even that mindset, you know, switch uh, because it's so powerful and liberating as soon as you do that. We have to show up for ourselves and take care of all parts of ourselves. If I don't show up for myself, how can I show up for you? How can I show up for others? How can I show up for my significant other, my family, my friends? I can't. So I am number one priority. Show up for yourself and really put put all your eggs in that basket because that basket will always return back to you, right? There will always be something to feed yourself and to feed others if you're showing up for yourself in that way. I'm also actively pursuing my dreams of doing something I'm passionate about, which is helping people heal and bringing about that divine intervention because I've had divine interventions from other people and I've always wanted to be that divine intervention for people who desperately need it and want it. As well as a partnership and marriage, um, I really want that and creating a family one day and a sustainable life for my family. uh, That's another thing that I really want. I'm actively pursuing that. And I'm living my dream every single day I wake up and open my eyes and feel the gratitude for my life, what it is right now and what it will be. And I want you guys to do the same. You should be waking up excited. You should be waking up feeling so grateful. You live another day. That is all you need. That is the only opportunity you need to enjoy your life is the fact that you opened your eyes, you're healthy, you're living. If you don't feel this way about your life, all it takes is a shift in your beliefs and mindset. If you can see it, you can have it. Thank you for listening. I really hope my journey speaks to you in such a way that you can find freedom in your own life. Thank you so much. I love you guys. Episode 10, hey, and many more to come.